I'm Shahar Razani, and in the news, Israel at war, not just in the south, but up north. As Israel continues to attack Hamas in Gaza, much of the IDF forces there have reportedly left the Gaza Strip, with some reports indicating that they're making their way up to northern Israel. Albeit not in the news that often, Israel's north has suffered immensely in the past few months of war, with daily missile attacks coming from Hezbollah, towns and villages on fire, as well as casualties. Around 10 IDF soldiers and 7 civilians have been killed so far, with more than 300 Hezbollah terrorists killed on the other side of the border. What should we expect from this next phase of the war? And is the north of Israel going to be the next arena? And how is Iran involved in all of this? To answer these questions and so much more, join us now is our favorite Dr. Eric Mandel. Dr. Mandel is the founder and director of MEPIN, Middle East Political and Information Network. He's a senior security editor at the Jerusalem Report and a prolific writer and speaker who's visited Israel quite a few times since October 7th. Eric, it's always a pleasure to have you joining us. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, let me first ask you, the reports about a withdrawal from Gaza by the IDF, um, supposedly indicating the end of the war in the South. Is it really? Help us understand where we stand now vis-a-vis -vis Hamas. Well, the idea that uh, Israel has moved out everything except its Nahal Brigade uh, and is just manning a corridor um, from that re really bisects um, the East-West Division about nine miles wide so they can both strike in the South and in the North um, sounds to the ears of Hamas and to Iran as this is uh, Israel succumbing to American uh, pressure. And it looks like a, a victory for Hamas, at least at this phase of the war, especially with uh, the president and the administration saying Israel cannot complete its job and destroy the last four to six battalions that um, uh, Hamas has in the South. Prime Minister Netanyahu has reportedly said that there is a date to enter Rafah, we've been saying that word Rafah for so many months now. How do you see the next phase? Do you agree that um, in practice Israel has halted the war? Or do you see it as just another temporary phase before Israel engages the Hamas battalions? Well, I think if Israel is going to come out of this um, looking as a victor in the next phase, I'll call it phase three of the war, um, it is going to need to enter Rafah. What America wants Israel to do, to just do airstrikes or pinpoint operations, will not be enough because that's going to go on for weeks and months and years, and the America and the international community will have no patience. Um, Israel should have, and I had spoken to the Israeli government, and they were uh, not listening to have started the humanitarian movement um, out of Rafa two months ago, um, and that they should have gone in. And once it's done in a fait accompli, then you have um, Hamas on the run, and then you're dealing with the mopping up of the insurgency. Right now, with them being so intact, including their leadership being intact, and they're moving slowly back um, into the center in the north. In fact, Hamas is controlling, um, even back in Khan Yunus, it is acting as the civil guard that's going on there right now. And the people, when they see Hamas still there, um, any people that might not want to support Hamas uh, for their own lives are not going to say anything. So Israel has to go back, has to go into Rafah in one way or another. Um, but the contention right now is the Biden administration can't see uh, that uh, that that Bibi Netanyahu um, and Israel government are not one in the same thing. But what they really need to know is that if this was Gantz or Lapid, they would be doing the same thing. However, America would give a lot more leeway to Israel to finish off Rafa if Bibi wasn't there. Right. I mean, it's quite staggering to think that people confuse the situation as if it's a direct result of the Netanyahu administration. But the truth is, just like you say, that's a demand by the Israeli people who are not willing to go back to living in the south with Hamas remaining intact. And yet I want to ask you something, Eric, with your expertise. Yes, indeed, the IDF needs to eradicate Hamas, but the long-term vision is not for Israel to be managing the civilian affairs in Gaza. And as long as there is no view or idea of what's going to happen to Gaza beyond that eradication, 
we're still in that um, limbo when Hamas police officers are governing Khan Yunus. How do you see the future of the Gaza Strip in this regard? What do you say to those who claim, as, as I said? Well, I, I think Israel, by not articulating a plan and maybe working in more conjunction with the United States, has hurt itself um, because Israel has operationally done a major, an amazing tactical victory over Hamas, even though it has stopped at Rafa, what it has done up to there. But you're dealing with having destroyed less than 50 percent of the tunnels, maybe 40 percent, and that you have much of the leadership still intact. Um, so uh, Israel has to think the day after right. what is the choice if you just leave anarchy if you leave hamas comes back if you go in and occupy it the last thing the israeli people want all right you may be able to control it and maybe you can have an occupation that you have like in the west bank and transition it to some reform Palestinian authority, um, or much better, you would want, wish you could have a NATO or Gulf states or Egypt or Jordan being involved, but none of those people want to be involved. The PA is not trusted by the Palestinians. Um, NATO wants to have nothing to do with this. The Gulf states in Egypt and Jordan want to run as far away as possible. So of the least bad option, um, and to allow the people of the Gaza envelope to return to their homes, um, I think Israel is going to have to occupy this and maybe have um, control some of the civil administration there if you don't want Hamas to do that. Um, this is going to be an insurgency there. It's going to be ugly. And, um, you know, I have to say that if that's what's going to be needed, it would be better not to have Prime Minister Netanyahu there, who will be continually blamed by the Americans from an international perspective. But there'll be, again, a little more leeway if that's the scenario that has to occur, um, if you have Gans or Lapid or some type of unity coalition going down the road. But, but at the very least, having those discussions between Israel and different countries around the world is in and of itself a message to Hamas that it has completely lost Gaza and it's no longer can considered as a viable entity to control the Gaza Strip as opposed to what we've seen in the past 17 years. Isn't that also an important message? I think I think Hamas does not think they've lost. I think they, like um, Iran, has what's called strategic patience at this point. Right. They think they outlast um, uh, Israel and the Americans will continue putting pressure on Israel to stop and that they can survive. And once they survive, they are a root that's planted there in Rafa, and they have, and they will grow from that root. And over time, they will take over the Gaza Strip. Right. And once this war is over, Israel's not going to want to go back in, except for pinpoint strikes. So they have to really be thinking right now: what is the day after? The administration has been correct about that. That Israel, they don't believe, has planned well enough for the day after. The, and the years after. Right. Um, that's that's the situation in the South. And indeed, I share your hope that we will see a different direction. But when it comes to the North, we've seen the Iranian Revolutionary Guards that have been active in Syria and Iraq and Lebanon with Hezbollah and others for years. Um, we have seen the uh, targeted assassination against the uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guards leadership in Damascus. How do you see this as another escalation in the in the war between Iran and its proxies against Israel, the U.S., the moderate Sunni states and the West? So I was told by one of the senior uh, national security advisors to Netanyahu that th why this occurred at that time. There's been other opportunities. So why now? Supposedly two red lines were crossed. Um, one that there was a direct strike from Iraq into Alat, and the quantity and quality of weapons going into the West Bank to Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad had crossed some Israeli red line. And that's why this attack occurred at that time. Now, if you believe that this is on Iranian soil because it was part of the consulate, which is kind of um, uh, a little ironic considering uh, if anybody knows the history of Iran and you go back to 1979 when they violated the American embassy and took the hostages, but now they're pleading that this is part of their diplomatic uh, territory. immunity. Right. So they have diplomatic immunity. But um, you got to remember who, this person who was killed, the lead person, uh, this general, was not only in charge of Iran to Lebanon and to Syria, but he was also of, in charge of the Palestinian sphere. And so that gets to the question about the arms going into the West Bank. 
Now, how does that term for what goes on in the North? Well, their number one ally in the North is, um, I shouldn't say ally, the group that follows um, exactly what the Ayatollah says right. by guardian the Juris, this Hezbollah. Um, and they have preferred, that has been their method, to use um, their proxies. Um, and it could be the Houthis, it could be Hamas, it could be PIJ, a popular mobilization units, militias in Iraq, um, against Israeli targets. I don't think American targets, and that could be any place in the world, um, or it could be in Israel. Um, and Israel has made it clear that if it's if it's targeted from Iranian territory, it will respond there. Um, and the places, if if they wanted to, if Israel should respond back, I think um, if, it, if it is to Iranian territory, which would be a, a much stronger message, would be two places. I I believe we discussed in the past Bandar um, Abbas um, uh, uh, and they in uh, Karg Island, places where their trade and the fossil fuels come from to cripple their economy. Um, and if the United States says they want to have they, we have ironclad, we're behind. That's what the president said behind right. Israel. Um, I think those are words. I don't think the Iranians believe it. Um, but if uh, America really wants to be ironclad and backing it, you make it clearer to decrease a regional war that America is willing to use kinetic force against Iran if they cross uh, and have a significant response against Israel for our interest, American interests. Right. We famously remember that at the beginning of the onslaught after the massacre, President Biden and the administration sent the aircraft carrier to Israel to send a clear message of don't to uh, Iran and its proxies. Do you anticipate that happening or do you recommend that to happen? Well, uh, first of all, I'm, I, I have a counter uh, argument there. I think the Americans uh, sent, my country sent, the carrier strike force uh, from the Ford uh, carrier to inhibit Israel from starting a regional war. Um, and that has been, and remember, in a political season, the number one thing this administration wants to do um, and for domestic politics is not to be in a war. A war plays into um, the uh, political opponent of Biden, which is Trump, forever wars. So they will do everything and anything. So I think the moving of the carrier group there was to inhibit Israel from, uh, from there. Um, but I know the message was it was to inhibit Iran um, and Hezbollah. You look at Iran's negative role in the region, and you and I have spoken about this many a time. The understanding that as long as the Islamic Republic is ruled by the mullahs, as long as their ideology is very clear, they will take advantage of any opportunity to achieve their, like you said, long-term strategic goals, uh, whether it's the Middle East, whether it's the world. Now they've used Hamas. We've seen it's a group that they've supported. We see the role that Hezbollah plays, by the way, not just vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Look at Lebanon and its destruction. We're seeing them active in Syria. We've seen them active in Iraq. We're seeing them supporting the Houthis in Yemen. So as they're like a, a, a time bomb. As long as they're ticking, the region may be up in flames. It may not happen now. It may happen next month, in a couple of years. But that's their end game. When do you think the world might, may realize that and decide to act against the source of that destabilizing force, or if at all? Well, I, I'm not optimistic about the world community uh, coming to the realization that Iran is the major problem of the Middle East. And if you allow to be pro-Iranian, to allow the Iranian people to have their say right. and to be in charge, that that whole region, I'm more than willing to bet that that will be the outcome will be much better for everybody in the region and lower the flames and advance American national security interests. Um, this president um, has shown that he is more likely to appease Iran. We do not enforce our uh, oil sanctions against them. They're selling almost an unlimited amount of oil to India and to China, which is enriching um, not only Iran and allowing it to survive, but to support its proxies, which are undermining our primary ally in the region. Um, it should become American foreign policy in an administration. I can't tell you this one or the next one, but sooner or later, that we need to be pro-Iranian people and that this current Iranian regime uh, is against American interests and that we need to actually show a backbone um, and not just have rhetoric against Iran. Um, as far as Europe, I have no confidence in Europe doing anything uh, other than the maximum appeasement. They are more than happy to be in bed with Iran as long as they feel Iran is not targeting them. Uh, they are more than willing to sacrifice Israel.
but my country should change its tune and have a major strategic reevaluation of how to effectively deal with the Islamic Republic, which is rational as a revolutionary entity that wants to destroy Israel and destroy the West in America. And that is who and what they're about. Right. Um, you know, we're talking about the chances of a war um, in the Middle East, a wider war between Israel, Iran, and the proxies. And I think one of the things you've written extensively about is the message that the weakening of the Israel-US alliance may send to these elements. Do you think that that criticism that came from the US sends a message to Iran and its proxies that this is the right time to strike at Israel? Well, I don't know if they're going to use that alone, but there is no doubt then they, when they see daylight between Israel and the United States, that shows American weakness, that you don't stand with your allies, and it shows it as, a, as an opportunity to take advantage of what it is, most likely not directly from Iran, but to use its, pro its proxies even more. Um, but again, at this point of time, I just don't think it's in Iran's interest to, to turn this into a major regional war because I don't believe they finished with the weaponization program uh, for their nuclear weapons, or they have plenty of material um, of uranium that they can turn into in 90% enriched uranium in just days time. Um, but they don't have the means to deliver it yet um, via the ballistic missiles, which it has, because they haven't gotten to the compartmentalization part of that. And the, the guess, and again, it's a guess, is it's un under two years until they do that. Um, so, but everybody's taking, you know, from what I've heard from the Israeli government, they used to meet twice a week um, about Iran, specifically about the nuclear program. And those meetings have been put on hold because of the Israeli uh, total focus on the South and in the North. Um, and it, it, so the idea is I think we've, we've taken our, uh, both America and Israel has taken its eyes off of their nuclear program. And Iran is getting everything it wants out of this Hamas war. The long-term vision that you're portraying, Eric, is quite scary because if this is a situation before Iran has nuclear weapons at her disposal, What's going to happen once it passes that threshold when it comes to the ability to deter the Mullah regime? It will become more emboldened. There is no doubt when they they really are a threshold nuclear state, when they really everybody feels that all they have to do is turn the final screw on a on a nuclear weapon um, for it to be active. I think, um, you know, it will change everything um, because everybody will be fearful. Uh, that is why Saudi Arabia was hoping that the United States would sign a defense pact with it. But I, you know, I don't think people really trust um, the United States um, to be there for them, especially um, you look today, it's four years, um, you know, since we left Afghanistan, the Taliban is back in place, which it's been uh, since uh, Trump time five years ago, since we never responded to the Aramco attack directly from Iran. Um, we are not that trusted. And if we abandon Israel, that is going to again, empower, embolden Iran to be more aggressive. And where do they have their eyes next? Their eyes next are on Jordan. And that is a strategic place for America. And if, if Jordan becomes uh, like Syria during its civil war, and that's what Iran would like, and they can have influence there, um, even though that's a Sunni country with Shiites, think about Syria. Shia is run by Alawites with majority Sunni, but Iran controls Syria. Um, you look at Lebanon, it's only 45% Shiite, but Iran controls Lebanon. Jordan is on there to, com to complete the ring of fire against Israel. And then who else do they want to destabilize? Gulf countries. So all of this goes totally against American national security interests and improves the axis of resistance. That's Iran, Russia, and America's number one nemesis for the 21st century, China. Do you think that... Um that message is being shared discreetly maybe in between the capitals of those moderate Sunni regimes that we're talking about, um, whether it's the Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and Washington, D.C. And do you think that their interests align with those of Israel at this point vis-a-vis -vis Hamas? You know, they give a lot of lip service to Hamas, to being supportive of the Palestinian people um, because that's what they need to do because they have radicalized lots of their societies. Scapegoating Israel is a way to deflect attention from their authoritarian regimes and mismanagement. Um, but what do they really want? 
Hamas is radical Sunni um, uh, Islamism, it's jihadism, um, and is supported by radical Shiite ideology um, from Iran. Um, they are fearful of all of it. So with, if you're Saudi Arabia, you fear the Muslim Brotherhood, which is the father of Hamas, and you fear Iran, um, which is the Shiite uh, leader and that wants to control the whole uh, world there. So they're quietly cheering for Israel to win, and they're quietly cheering to hope America stands with Israel because they know if America doesn't stand with Israel, they become much more vulnerable. I want to go back to the North for a minute. We're talking about the potential of escalation in the North, but like I said at the beginning, the North has been suffering immensely in the course of the, the past few months. We're talking about tens of thousands of Israelis who can't go back home. We're talking about Hezbollah, vile terrorists who are firing anti-tank missiles into people's living rooms, killing them while they're having lunch, targeting businesses throughout the place. Cities like Metula and Kiryat Shmona have become ghost cities. So in actuality, Israel has been engaged in a significant war up north that's been widely ignored, don't you think? Right. So if there was not a war going down in the south, this would be considered a major regional war. So you're absolutely correct. Um, thousands of projectiles have gone back and forth. Israel strikes into Lebanon since October 7th because Hezbollah became active um, are so much more. Uh, so this is a very active war. It's not a, you know, people refer to as tit for tat. People are dying there, uh, there are 100,000 people who are displaced in their homes. So how does this end? So you have a few possibilities. Very unlikely that through the president of, of ba President Biden sending Amos Hochstein, that he's going to convince Hezbollah to withdraw to north of the Latani River, which is what the UN Security Council demanded after the Second Lebanon War. The French proposal, which is 10 kilometers, a very short distance north of the border that the Radwan forces move back to, um, is uh, something Israel would accept. But I don't think the people of the north would accept that because they are going to be vulnerable. And especially if there's drip, drip, drip of missiles coming into the north, that's not what they signed up for. And if Israel is going to be a sovereign country, it's going to have to be able to control the border right to the border and let every citizen live there who wants to live there. Um, it, will that be possible without doing a major operation there? Um, I'm not sure, um, but temporarily you might be able to get it to be quiet, but the people of the North don't want to go back to a status quo um, on October 6th. Um, they don't believe uh, they, they can trust that. You remember, Israel was distracted from the South primarily because what happened in the South is what they thought was going to happen in the North with the Radwan units um, coming in, infiltrating communities there. So the I, you know, the operational intelligence failure in the South actually had something to do with the North and the preparations that were there and underestimating your adversary in the South, Hamas. But let me counter you on that point, point for a minute, Eric. The idea that, uh, you know, Amos Hochstein's diplomacy and a diplomatic solution and an agreement even if Israel engages in a war with uh, Hezbollah up north, what's going to be at the end of that, um, of that war? There is going to be potentially the same thing, right? Engaging diplomatically to bring an end to it. Maybe it's the UN Security Council. Maybe it's Amos Hochstein and the Americans. Maybe it's somebody else, the French. But at the end of the day, won't we reach exactly the same point where we have to negotiate unless the vision is for Israel to take physical control over the territory? How do you see, how do you answer those who say the only way forward is have to be an agreement and the decision that needs to be made is whether it happened before hostilities or after host the increase of hostilities? Yeah, you know, I think the day after is much harder in the north than it is in the south, and we know how difficult the south is. So, what what are the possibilities? Um, Israel accepts a uh, a condition that is like pre October sixth, but they move a little farther north. Um, Israel is going to look weak there, but they they may look at it as just buying time. If Israel goes in operationally, there is nobody to hand it to. The Lebanese armed forces they're either inept or complicit um, right. with Hezbollah. Right. To the UN, the so, UN has stopped zero of the 150,000 missiles in the last 17 years that is there. Right. Um, they see no evil, hear no evil, speak right. no evil. I mean, the UN is, is more, it does more harm than good to, a, to a large 
extent that's there. Right. Um, so you basically have a situation up north um, where you in, in Israel, remember from Israel controlled southern Lebanon from 82 to 2000 and, and popular demand to allow that to stay in place evaporated with Israeli soldiers being killed there. And so they had to leave after the, you know, after 18 years there. So I think up north, um, that's why Israel is willing to accept the unsatisfying 10 kilometer movement up wow. north. But to believe that Radwan won't be, remember, there is a tunnel network that may be more sophisticated in southern Lebanon. Um, underneath it, you have you have tunnels there that go into Israel. They've discovered a lot of those. Right. Who knows how many? You have um, uh, you have ambush tunnels. You have explosive tunnels. You have tunnels that go underneath almost every town that's there and missiles in people's homes. And you have major tunnels that go from the Bakar Valley to Beirut down to southern Lebanon. This is a much more sophisticated adversary right. that's going. You get, and by the way, Israel's not going to have. More, you know, six months to do what Correct. it needs to do. In the not not to, to mention, go. not to mention the human shields. You have Radwan forces embedded within every civilian infrastructure in the southern Lebanon. So even if they do go back the 10 kilometers, they may still be in civilian outfits embedded within those villages. So I, I completely understand. I saw that when I was embedded with the unit, uh, looking um, at intelligence pictures, looking um, at, at civilian homes where you had um, Hezbollah, you know, in those civilian homes. And again, just like Hamas, um, they ha they commit war crimes because they many of them uh, have no distinction in dress. Right. So you don't know civilians or not. And again, um, I, you know, one of the think tanks I work with, which is fantastical Alma, the go to think tank in the north, um, they d have documented many, many times how they have positioned themselves all throughout Lebanon, next to civilian areas, next to schools and UN facilities and mosques and electric plants, all things that the world community will come down on Israel if it attacks legitimate targets, again, embedded in civilian areas. Eric, we're lucky to have you trying to uh, remove some of the haze and mist around such a complex situation in a very complicated region. Thank you for the time you've taken to share your insights with us. My pleasure. Always for you, Shahar. Always a pleasure to listen to Eric Mandel and always wonderful to listen to the wise analysis provided by Eric, making sense of the complexities we face today in the Middle East, but so much more beyond. And to all of you, our viewers, we will continue to keep you updated as things move forward in Israel and across the world. This is why we are here and this is our commitment to you at JBS. May we see better days soon. I'm Shahar Azani and thank you all for watching.